on RF power, how you generate it and how you couple it into the cavity. So your typical RF system looks a bit like this. You have your generator, which is your klystron. You have a transmission line. Then you have something known as a circulator, which everything moves right in a circle. Power coming in this port will come out that port. Power coming in that port will come out that port. And power coming out of this port will go to that port. This is quite useful because your power goes through the circulator to the cavity and anything that's reflected goes to your load and not to your generator. So circulators are quite useful. It then goes through another transmission line to your cavity and coupled in there. Again, with equivalent circuits, you can model that quite easily. Uh, you have your generator, uh, which is a, basically it's a parallel current source and a load. You have your coupler, which is a transformer, and you have your cavity that you've already, you've already got. And by solving the cut laws for this system, you can look at the dynamic behaviour of a generator and cavity together as a pair, um, which is quite useful. Now, as well as the ohmic Q factor, which we saw in the first lecture, we also have something known as the external Q factor, which is the ratio of stored energy to power deposited in the load. Um, now this is useful because we haven't just got power going to the cavity as heat, we've also got some power going back out the coupler, or couplers, and you may have multiple, um, and that power goes to the load. So you, you lose power from the cavity, the stored energy goes down, but it doesn't go into the cavity walls as heat. So we define this external Q factor, QE, as omega U over, over, over PE. Um, and you get the total Q factor of the system as 1 over QL, which we call the loaded Q factor, that's the total Q factor of the system, equals 1 over QE plus 1 over Q0. Uh, if you have multiple couplers, it's 1 over Q1 plus 1 over QE2, so on. Um, now, this is where it gets complicated, because we've got uh, the, the symbol beta. Now, unfortunately, we've already defined that beta. Beta is V over C, but now we've also got beta equals uh, P over PC or Q0 over QE. And you've also got beta functions. So unfortunately, in Excel letter science, we've used the letter beta three times. Uh, it'd be useful if we if we find out there was more Greek letters than beta, but apparently everyone uses beta for everything. Um, so in this lecture, when I talk about beta, I'm talking about this beta. I'm not talking about the other two betas. Uh, maybe I should label them differently in future. But unfortunately for this lecture, beta is going to be Q0 over QE. Uh, and you get your loaded Q factor, which is your total Q factor, equals omega U over P total. Beta is quite handy. It comes out quite a lot in the, in the later equations. But this is your loaded Q factor. This is your total Q factor of the system related to the external and the ohmic Q factors. So, before I go on any further, I need to explain uh, a concept in RF known as scattering parameters. So, say we've got a black box here, it could be anything, it could be a cavity couple system, it could be uh, a diplex, it could be any RF component. We don't know what's inside of it. We have an input signal that comes into this black box, and we will get two outputs if it's a two-port system. We'll have a, a reflected signal coming back, and we'll have a transmitted signal going out the other port used as a, a black box. We could do the same thing in reverse. We could put a signal into port 2, and we would get a uh, reflected from port 2 and a transmitted from port 1. So we end up with a matrix of four components. We have um, each component is a matrix, which is M by N, where M is the number of available ports, um, and, and so you have an M by N matrix. So um, each, ma each element of the matrix has a, a, a position, S11, S12, S21, S22. And what that means is it's the ratio of the measured voltage to the input, the output voltage to the input voltage. So SAB is uh, the measured signal at port A due to an input at port B. So S11 is if you put power into port 1, what gets reflected? S12 is if you put power into port 2, what comes out of port 1. And so on S21, so if you put power into port 1, what do you get out of port 2? And S22 is what if you put some peg signal into port 2, what gets reflected back to port 2. So you end up with a matrix. A three-port a three port system has it in a 3x3 three three matrix, a two-port system is a 2x2 two two matrix. Um, it's very useful. It allows you to characterise any RF system with this matrix, as opposed to understanding what's inside the, the black box. 
Typically, we plot this as a function of frequency. So, for example, this is, um, well, it's power, but it's also S21 squared. So, this is S21 squared as a function of frequency uh, for a cavity. And what you see is you see what we call as a resonance behavior. This is for a match system. So, um, you get um, a lot of transmission at the resonant frequency. And away from that, you don't get a lot of transmission. Power doesn't get through the cavity. Typically, it will be reflected. Uh, the, from the system you measure, the bandwidth of the resonance is 1 over what we call TL, which is the, the loaded time, which is given by a mega naught, which is the resonant frequency, divided by QL, which is the loaded Q factor. So the cavity has a re finite resonance, a finite width over which it operates. Uh, given by 1 over, but well, a mega naught over QL. So if you have a very high loaded Q cavity, you have a very narrow resonance, which can be problematic if your QL is too large in some superconducting systems, you end up being unstable because you can never keep your cavity's resonant frequency to a small enough level. For example, if you ran a superconducting cavity at its maximum Q, it could run at 10 to the, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, its bandwidth would be on the order of a hertz. So it's very hard to stabilize something to one hertz. It's one part in 10 to the 9. So even just vibrations, if you talk near a cavity, it'll vibrate more than 10 to the nine, one part in 10 to the 9. So um, you can never really run it at its um, stably anyway, at its maximum Q0. There's, there's, there's some phase control techniques you can do to stabilize it, but it wouldn't work on an accelerator, but it can work on measurements. Um, so instead, you have to have a QL which is a finite value. Um, the, the part of the ERL systems like ERL is people have been trying to work out the, the, the most stable system they can run to increase the QL and therefore use less power to run it. But typically the best you can run at is about 10, 10 to the 7 HQ because um, you have this bandwidth. Um, so you, you measure your S parameters as a function of frequency and you can get things like this out of it. Your, your transmission plots, <laughs> and that you learn a lot about your system from the S parameters. So this is S11 of a cavity. S11 looks like this. So typically, this is what we call a match system, um, where the reflections go to zero one resonance. So if you are off resonance, you can see you got 100% reflections. All the power that comes into the cavity gets reflected back out of it. So none of the power gets into the cavity. As you move its frequency closer to the resonant frequency, the amount reflected goes down and the amount that goes into the cavity goes up until you get to this point here, resonance, um, in which case you get no reflected signal. That doesn't mean all the power is staying in the cavity. Sometimes the power can go into the cavity then leave by the other port, but um, certainly you don't get any reflection. So the power is at least all going into the cavity on resonance. You have to do a bit of playing about with impedances to get it matched. Um, if you just use any old cavity, typically this value will be up here somewhere. Um, but a well-designed RF system will look like this. All the power gets into the cavity. And then as you go further in frequency, it goes off resonance again, and the power goes out. And again, the, the bandwidth is uh, about 3 dB, um, typically across there. Um, actually, it's about here, because the bandwidth is in power on its square root, so it's about this level. Is the bandwidth. Oops. Oh, and here we go. So for a given cavity system, S11, which is the reflected power, is given by on resonance 1 minus beta E over 1 plus beta E. Ah, so I did remember to label them differently. So beta E is the Q0 over QE. I just forgot to label it on the first slide. So if a beta E is the um, the beta function, the Q0 over QE. So you can tell the difference between that and the V over C1. Uh, so PTE, uh, remember, is Q0 over QE. So it's 1 minus PTE over 1 plus PTE. So obviously you want PTE to be equal 1, because when PTE equals 1, S11 goes to 0, you have a match system. So you want Q0 to equal QE for a match system. I'll show you this a bit later on where this comes from. And, and the advanced lectures I do next year, um, I do a full derivation of that equation. I don't do it in introductory lectures. I've only got four. So, cavity coupling, we end up with three sets of behaviour. We have filling, we have steady state, 
and we have emptying the cavity, they behave slightly differently. So first of all, when, when the beam is in there, you'll be in steady state. The cavity will have been filled, and it'll reach its maximum stored energy, and it'll be sitting at that stored energy. So the stored energy and the cavity, because of this reflection coefficient, um, the shunt impedance gives you the amount of power that goes into the cavity related to the voltage. But not all the power gets into the cavity because you get reflections. So when you include the reflections in there, the stored energy you get in the cavity is given by 4 times beta E. Oh, I forgot to use E again. Times the forward power, that's the power from the klystron, divided by 1 plus beta E squared times Q0 over omega. So you can see the beta is again important. And when beta equals 1, you're left with the, the, the equation you have for Q, Q0. Um, U0 equals PF times Q0 over omega U. But when you've got mismatches in there, um, you don't get all the power into the cavity and you get less stored energy than you would have done had you matched your system up. Um, the reflected power, as I said previously, is beta E minus 1 over beta E plus 1 squared because it's power times the, the forward power. So um, this is steady state. So you want to try and get the most power you can to your cavity by matching it. Um, you want beta to equal, beta e to equal 1. Now when filling, you get slightly more complex behaviour. Because what happens is, when I said the reflections go to zero, they don't instantaneously go to zero. Because you have an impedance mismatch in there. Your cavity has an impedance of, I don't know, 100 ohms or something, mega ohm or something like that, typically. And mega ohms, your normal cavity impedance, or giga ohms for superconducting systems. But your klystron and transmission line have a 50 ohm impedance. So you're trying to match a mega ohm into 50 ohms. Doesn't quite go, so you get a lot of reflections. But what happens is the power comes into the cavity down the coupler and it reflects. Then a small amount of that power, maybe a fraction of a percent, gets into the cavity. Then it's in the cavity, but some of it then comes back out of the coupler because it's coupled to the system. So then you have power coming in to your coupler, it's reflected, and then you have power, some of the power gets into the cavity and then gets emitted back out of the cavity. And it turns out the emitted power is exactly 180 degrees out of phase from the reflected power because you get a reflection at 180 degrees but uh, an emitted power has no phase change on it. So then because the 180 degrees out of phase, the reflected power, some of the reflected power gets cancelled by the emitted power, which means more of the power gets into the cavity. So the emitted power grows, then it cancels out more of the reflected signal and so on until for a match system, the reflected and emitted powers exactly cancel out and you get zero reflections. So this is the case, beta equals 1, beta E equals 1 is the green one. It starts off at 100% reflections, it drops with time and then goes to a steady state of zero. But what if your system is mismatched? We've seen in steady state, if you have a mismatched system, the reflections don't go to zero. So let's say we have a system where Q0 is much smaller than QE, so QE is very high. We call that an undercoupled case. In this case, the amount of emitted power is much lower than the reflected power, so you don't get complete cancellation. So it decays with time, but doesn't go to zero, goes to some finite value in steady state. The more complex case is what if Q0 is actually much larger than QE? What if QE is very small, which we call overcoupled? In this case, again, it decreases with time as your emitted power grows. But then, at this point here, your emitted power is equal to your reflected power, the same as we had in, in the match case. But the cavity hasn't finished being filling yet. It's not in steady state yet. So you get even more power into the cavity, and then the emitted power grows, and it actually starts to increase again. Your emitted power starts to get bigger than your reflected power, so your reflections start to increase again. But this time, these two cases are 180 degrees out of phase from each other. This is reflection dominated, this is emission dominated. So you've got, this one is mostly power reflected from the coupler, and this is mostly power getting into the cavity and then leaking back out the coupler. Your, couplers, your coupling's too strong, you're taking too much power out the cavity once it gets in there for the blue case, whereas the, the red case is just you can't get power into the cavity in the first place. It ends up the system behaves exactly the same in both cases, apart from 180 degree phase on the reflections. Um, so undercoupled and overcoupled are just as bad as each other. No, this is without a beam. With a beam it gets a bit more complicated. 
because a match system with beam isn't matched without beam and vice versa. So typically you'll operate without beam either on the blue curve or the red curve and then when the beam comes in it then matches and goes to the green curve. But we'll see that later on in the lecture. So this is the filling behaviour you get for the different systems. And you can use this in testing to see if you're undercoupled or overcoupled. You measure the reflections and you know you've got a mismatch. But by filling it and looking at the reflections in time, if it does this, you're undercoupled. If it does that, you're overcoupled. So you can look at the reflections and see if it goes to zero or not. And it can tell you which side you're on. Now, then you've got the beam coming in. Now, the beam's a problem because the Q factors are related to loss mechanisms. Power being taken in or out of the cavity. So you have a one representing the power loss in the cavity due to overheating, heat in the walls. You have one due to power being pulled out of the cavity by couplers into loads. But you also have a third term, which is the beam. The beam will be accelerated or decelerated by the RF. Therefore, the beam is gaining or losing energy. And therefore, that energy must be gained or lost from the cavity. So the beam draws a power of the cavity voltage times the beam current. That can be big or small, depending on what beams you, you're using. That can be megawatts for some ampere class beams and ERLs. It could be watts for things like Alice. So it can be, sometimes it's noticeable, sometimes it isn't, depending on what sort of system you've got. The beam current is the charge times the frequency because accelerator physicists like to use charge. So it's to, not the frequency of the cavity, but the repetition frequency of the beam. So one megahertz or something, uh, times the, the stored charge per beam. So you get a beam current multiplied by the voltage gives you a beam uh, power that's been taken out of the system. Um, now, when you look, what we care about is because we are at the coupler end. We have, we have some diagnostics on the line between the klystron and the cavity. We can measure reflected and transmitted power at the interface between the cavity and the klystron. So we can tell what's happening at that point. We cannot tell what's happening at any other point in the system. We haven't got diagnostics in the cavity. We have only got diagnostics on couplers. So in terms of what we see, in terms of the cavity being a black box, we, we see this additional loss from the beam as being looking like a cavity loss. You know, you, you cannot tell the difference looking from the klystron between power lost as heat in the walls and power lost through the beam. They are both acceleration of currents. One's in the walls, one's in the beam current. So it's just another passive loss. So you can add the beam losses to the cavity ohmic losses to, to see what would happen to your system. So now we can define a new Q factor, which I call QCD, which is a mega U over the power loss in the cavity walls due to ohmic heating and the power loss in the beams. And then you can work out your loaded Q factor by including QE in it, and you can apply that back into the steady state equation. But now you have beta EB, where, if I do this, I think it should appear. Here we go. Beta EB is QCB over QE. So QCB is the ohmic plus the beam losses, QE is the external losses, and we get a new steady state equation. But you can see now, we again, we want to be at beta EB equals one, but beta EB equals one isn't the same as beta E equals one unless the beam losses are very small. If the beam losses are very small, it's the same. If the beam losses are large, matched, the matched Q and E varies. So when you're operating your system with heavy beam loading, the condition to be matched with the beam isn't the same condition for matched without the beam. So you would want to use a different external Q for each case. But of course, you can't change the QE dynamically, or at least it's very difficult. There are some plasma switches, but no one ever uses them in accelerators because they're a bit unreliable. Mm. So your QE doesn't change, so you're fixed to choosing one Q, external Q. You can either choose to be matched with the beam or without the beam, not both. Now, because you need your most power in the case when you have the beam in there, because you've got the most losses, you will choose to be matched when the beam is there, not when the beam isn't there. So typically, without the beam, when you're running your system without the beam, when you're testing your system, you will not be running in a match case. You'll be running overcoupled or undercoupled. Mostly overcoupled, actually, because the beam losses need additional coupling. So you're typically overcoupled, and then when the beam turns up, you're matched and you get all your power in. 
The only time that may be different if you're running single bunch mode. If you're a single bunch with a very high charge, you might use something different. But uh, for most cases, you'll match with the beam. So, this is your typical RF system complete now. Because before, we just had the amplifier, the transmission system, and the cavity. But it's a bit more complex than that. Because... The RF amplifier needs to be fed by a low-level RF system. Your amplifier amplifies something. You need to put something <coughs> into your amplifier to be amplified. So you generate a low-power RF signal from your low-level RF boards. It has the right phase and amplitude for the beam. It then goes to the amplifier and amplified. Now, the RF amplifier doesn't create energy out of nowhere. It must take power from a DC system, a DC power supply or modulator, supplies power to the amplifier, and then what the amplifier does is it takes some of the DC power and converts it into RF power. Um, and, and so you get a, this low power RF signal comes in and it leaves a high power RF signal. It gets transmitted to the cavity via various diagnostics to measure reflected and transmitted powers, systems like circulators, splitters, whatever, however your system works, then goes into the cavity. You then have some measurements from the cavity, from the transmission line through some, some other probe couplers, that then come back via feedback loop to your low level RF system. You can then measure if you if you have the wrong phase in your cavity, you'll know it and you can adjust it through your low level RF system. So this is the full typical RF system. Um, it's a wee bit more complicated than just the, the cavity couple system we've looked at. Now in fact, if you look at it in a bit more detail, people talk about click being a two beam scheme as if it's something normal. In fact, we've always used two beam, two beam schemes and accelerators because your klystron itself is actually a mini particle accelerator in reverse. A klystron operates because you've got an electron gun which generates charged particles. They get bunched by an RF input. You then have a bunched beam, so if a DC beam goes into an RF output, it interacts with the beam and it excites a very high power RF wave which then goes into the cavity which then accelerates another beam and then you have a collector, which is like a beam dump. So the two beam system, we've always had two beam systems in every accelerator. Alice and Clara and Emma, they're all two beam systems. What Click actually is, is a three beam system, but most people don't view it that way because you have a klystron driving your drive beam, which drives your main beam in Click. So Click's actually a three beam system, but perhaps I go into too much detail. But certainly you have to remember your klystron itself isn't too different from an actual particle accelerator. So if we want to look at things like klystrons, um, we have to know some of the basic amplifier equations. The first thing is gain. Gain is the ratio of the output RF power to the input RF power. Not the input power, because that would be something different. It's the input RF power. So that's your small signal that goes in to your RF power that comes out. So it's PRF over PN. We then have our efficiency, which is becoming more and more important. CERN currently uses 10% of all Geneva's power. If they were to build CLIC or FCC, they would use more power than the rest of Geneva put together. It would actually need new power plants to be built in Geneva just to power the next machine after, after LHC. So efficiency is very important because a klystron is maybe 60% efficient, 50% efficient, and then you back it off so you run at half that value. So maybe you're at 25% efficiency. If you're using 10% of Geneva's power, the difference between half and a quarter is quite a big gap. But so if you can improve the efficiency, you would actually save a huge amount of money for CERN and infrastructure. You wouldn't have to build new power plants. Um, so efficiency is the output RF power divided by the DC input power. Strictly speaking, you should also include the RF input, but the RF input's a watt and the DC input's a megawatt, so it's in the noise. Um, but that should also include solenoid um, power supplies as well in that DC power. But people often miss that as well, but you probably shouldn't. Um, so if the efficiency is low, you need a large DC power supply and a high electricity bill. If the gain is low, you need an input power, which is also very high. There are some RF sources called tetrodes, which don't have a lot of gain. So when you use a tetrode, you have to have another big amplifier, maybe another tetrode, to, to run it, and you have a chain of amplifiers. With a klystron, drawing, your gain's about 100,000. So a megawatt amplifier only needs a couple of watts, tens of watts going in, maybe 100 watts. So the chain's a lot smaller. So 
there's your gain. Often we do gain in dB rather than log scale. I'll talk about dB quite a lot. Um, to convert between uh, linear gain and log gain, it's just 10 times the logarithm to the power of 10 of the gain. So 10 dB is a factor of 10, 20 dB is a factor of 100, 30 dB is 1,000, so on. <clears throat> right, so starting at the start of klystron. So I talked about earlier about how when you had um, electrons were contained in metals by work functions, if you apply a high enough electric field, they can overcome that work function. You can also do it by applying temperature to it. You can heat up your cathodes so that the thermal energy of the electrons is high enough to overcome the work function. And this is what we get for an electron diode. This is how all diodes used to work before we had solid state ones. Um, so you heat your cathode up, the energies have sufficient energy to leave the surface. We then apply a voltage across it to, to pull out those electrons and travel across the gap. And you have your electron gun. Now, that's to create a DC one. Now, sometimes you don't want a DC gun, you want an AC gun. So to do that, we have a control grid in there. The grid is very close to the cathode, so that it creates a very high electric field for a very small voltage, because voltage is uh, electric field is voltage over gap. So if you've got a very small gap, you can have a very small voltage to get the same electric field. So you have a grid close to the cathode, which can uh, a small voltage can apply can control the emission of the electrons, and then you have a larger voltage on your anode. So you can then apply. Uh, a small AC voltage to your grid and create an AC beam coming out with a very high voltage and a very high current. Typically, although accelerators will use milliamps, uh, klystrons will use tens of amps. So it's a, it's a much higher current technology. Now, if you can do an AC um, gun, then you generate your first RF amplifier, the tetrode or the triode. The triode is the more basic of the two. The triode is just exactly that. It's an anode, it's a cathode, and it's a grid. You apply the AC signal to the grid, which is a small voltage which controls the emission um, from the high voltage uh, diode, and you get a pulsed AC signal coming between your anode and cathode, and your, <clears throat> your DC applied between your anode and cathode at a high voltage translates into a, um, a high power coming out at AC due to the modulation on the grid. Um, they don't work very well at high frequencies because your grid has to get so close to the gap because, again, it takes time for the electrons to get between the anode and the cathode. So your grid needs to get very close at high frequencies to get it to work um, because it's an AC field. So tetrodes tend not to work above 300 megahertz or something like that. But uh, And they don't have very good gain yet either. But they're, they're, they're fairly standard devices at low frequencies. They're not very noisy. They, they produce good uh, RF characteristics apart from gain. Um, their efficiency is intermediate. They're very reliable. ISIS's tetrodes have been running for 15 years and they haven't blown up yet. Um, we've got some here for the MICE project that Andy Moss is doing. If you ever get a chance to see that, they're quite impressive. Um, they're big beasts. Um, so a tetrode's like a triode, apart from you have two, two grids. One's to kind of protect the anode from electrons that hit them. It's a screening grid. It kind of stops any coupling between the anode and the grid. Um, it's a sort of screening effect. So the theory of a, a, a tetrode, um, we tend to use similar technology to what we did in solid state. We have class A, B, C amplifiers. That When we run our grid, we tend to bias the grid. So You've got your AC signal, but it's not AC but zero. It's a biased AC signal, so it oscillates like that. So you increase it a bit. Class A is where the it never goes negative. At the minima, this point here, the voltage goes to zero, not negative. So therefore, um, you've got your your biased voltage in there. Um, uh, your DC current equals your AC current. Uh, so we'll start up here actually. So your total current is given by DC plus AC. So this is your current with time because you're pulsing your grid, a sinusoidal like class A. So you've always got a emission at all points, but it has a sinusoidal oscillation at. Uh, your DC input power is given by uh, the anode voltage times IDC. Your AC input power is given by the grid voltage times IAC. Um, the grid voltage is much smaller than the anode voltage because of the small gap. 
your AC output cover output power is given by V anode times IAC. So you can see here if IAC and IDC are about the same, and these two are orders of magnitude different because you've got a small gap, you get a lot of gain. Your gain here is uh, is V anode over V grid. So in class A, we set it so that IDC equals IAC. You can choose different ones, but um, class A is, is where IDC equals IAC. Other options are available. Uh, efficiency is then PRF over PDC, which is 50%. You can see they're both done by V anode, but it's uh, IDC, IAC over IDC. Uh, sorry, it's uh, I. AC over IAC plus IADC, so it's 50%. Um, your gain is PIF over PN, which is V anode over V grid. Um, you could also operate it in things like class B, where you don't bias it as much and you get you get slightly more efficiency. Um, the reason you don't operate in class B is because if you did a Fourier transform of this, you'd just be left with the first harmonic in DC. If you Fourier transform this, you get harmonics in there. So class A has the lowest efficiency, but the most linear signal. The class B has harmonics, but it's more efficient. And you go further on, different classes of amplifier. Um, so tetrodes are, triodes are not too bad. 50% efficiency, but the gain typically is limited by the gap to about a factor of 100, maybe 20 dB. Normally about 15 dB is more, more likely. Here's an example. Here's the CERN tetrode for... Uh, Oh, I think this might be the PS. Uh, frequency of 200 megahertz. Uh, power is 62 kilowatts. Um, gains 14 dB, close to what I said. Efficiency is 64%. It's not quite class A. Uh, cathode voltage is 10 kilovolts. So the gain is very low. So for 62 kilowatts output, you need something on the order of 3, watt, uh, three kilowatts input, which isn't small. Um, so you need a solid state power amplifier or IoT or another tetro to drive it um, and therefore that decreases the overall efficiency and increases the cost considerably. There's also something called a diacrode you'll come across which is like two tetros back to back so it gives you twice the power for, for a given frequency. Um, but tetrodes <laughs> are the, the old Machines, you it's hard to get a tetrode nowadays. Most suppliers of RF sources don't sell tetrodes anymore. Talus do, but very few do. It's hard to get a good tetrode nowadays. Um, they're not really used for many applications. I think the only people that use it now is uh, proton synchrotrons, are the only people that use tetrodes. Um, so, how do you do better than a tetrode? Well, let's say we have a beam travelling through a cavity, and this applies to RF cavities as well. Klystrons and cavities act exactly the same. We'll see this in my last lecture when we talk about excitation of modes by, by the beam. Um, so the beam comes through your cavity. Your beam's travelling down your beam pipe, which is conducting, and because it's a charge and a metallic pipe, it has an image charge which follows it. So the beam's coming down, there's an image charge in the pipe that travels at the same speed as the beam. It then gets to your gap. Now, the image charge can't jump the vacuum gap, so the image charge has to go the long way round. Whereas the beam goes across the vacuum. That means your image charge is left behind a wee bit. So then you have your image charge is positive, you get a deceleration of your image charge by the beam. Um, there's an attraction between the two, so your beam decelerates a bit. Because it's been decelerated, it loses energy, and that energy is transferred into the RF modes of the cavity. It then leaves, and it has to generate a new image charge, so it loses more energy again. So it leaves with slightly less energy, sometimes more energy if it's designed properly, and um, there's RF left in the cavity. For a klystron, you design it to give as much power as possible to the cavity. For, a, for an accelerating cavity, you design it to give as little power as possible to the cavity. But it's the same, same system. And then that power can then be extracted um, some other way. So <clears throat> a, a system that uses this is the IoT. The IoT is very similar to a tetrode in its front part, you have a gridded gun and you produce an AC beam coming out. But rather than smashing that into the anode to collect what's left, you instead have a cavity. So this punch beam goes through the cavity and excites an RF field in the cavity. Um, now the cavity is very good at storing energy over long periods of time. Um, and then that acts back on them to give you more deceleration. 
So it's actually much more efficient interaction than you get in a Tetroid. And then gets put to the beam dump called the collector. Um, now, because of that efficient interaction with the cavity, it gets a higher gain than a Tetroid and higher efficiency than a Tetroid. So this is a, a Talus IoT here. I think this is the one that we use at Diamond. Um, 80 kilowatts, 34 kV, 2.2 amps. From the, that's the DC input. Um, there's its size and weight. 72.6% efficiency. So it's very efficient. Um, 25 dB again, much better than the Tetroid by about an order of magnitude. So it only needs 160 watts drive, which can be done quite easily from a solid state box. Uh, it lasts for 35,000 hours of runtime, and you can combine them together to create more power. So in Diamond, they put four together to create 300 kilowatts. <clears throat> so IoTs are a slightly better solution than Tetroids. They operate at slightly higher frequencies. These can go up to maybe two gigahertz at the most. But above 2 gigahertz, neither Tetros or IOTs work because you're limited by this grid. This grid causes all your sorts of problems. Also, with the grid technology, you've got a lower current because the DC beam is always on. If you're pulsing your current, then the average current is reduced because it's pulsing. The peak, if the peak current stays the same, the average current is reduced. So the limitation of IOTs and Tetros is the grid. You get lower current out of them, therefore lower power. And also that they only go to low frequencies. So um, you have to get rid of the grids to go any better. So that leads us to the Klystron. So we get rid of the grid, we've got our DC going in here. Now, the DC beam will not excite a cavity. So we need to somehow bunch that beam. So we do that uh, in the same way as we bunch beams and accelerators. We have an input, we have an RF cavity in here. We put power into the RF cavity and we accelerate the beam. So it's just the same as a particle accelerator. But we, because it's a DC beam coming in, some electrons get accelerated, some of them get decelerated. And because it's sub-relativistic for most klystrons, you get relativistic klystrons, but most of them are sub-relativistic. Um, the electrons that get accelerated travel faster. The ones that get decelerated travel slower because it's non-relativistic, or not fully relativistic at least. Um, they, they start to bunch in time. The, the faster ones get faster, the slower ones get slower, and you create bunches. You can then have a bunch of cavities, as we call them. This is your input cavity that starts the bunching process. You can have intermediate cavities that increase that. So your beam comes through the cavity, it just is an RF field in that cavity, which then acts back on the beam. So we don't take the power out of these intermediate cavities. The, the bit of bunching here just is a bit of an RF field, which then causes more bunching. And we can add two, three, four intermediate cavities to increase the bunching process. And at the end, we have the output cavity. The, the beams are now fully bunched. They go through the output cavity. They generate a huge RF field. And then we extract that through some coupler to go to the, our accelerator system. And then we dump it in the collector stroke beam dump. So this is a, a klystron. Uh, and this will operate up to maybe 30 gigahertz. Certainly the 12 gigahertz ones exist at high power. Um, we, we use some at Lancaster. Well, not at Lancaster, but at CERN. Um, we, we have access to them. Um, they can go up to maybe about 30, I think. But it's a bit of a push at 30. Um, now, these systems, because they've got the DC beam coming in, they operate at higher powers. So the IoT will operate at maybe 100 kilowatts. Your Tetra will work at maybe 200 kilowatts. Your Klystron will go up to 50 megawatts. So it's a much higher power system. And because it's got no grid, it'll work at higher frequencies, I say up to about 30 gigahertz. So a factor of 10 more frequency than the IoT. So if you want power and you want high frequency, the Klystron is, is the only option. Unless you go to very high frequencies. When you go to very high frequencies, then gyro Klystrons then become better. But up to about 30 gigahertz, or up to at least 20, Klystrons are the dominant uh, source. And here's an example of the Klystron that they were thinking about using in Diamond, but didn't. I don't know where they use it. Uh, so it's a 300 kilowatt klystron. Its DC is 51 kV, 8.48 amps. You can see it's a higher current. Uh, it's two meters tall, 60% efficiency, but operates at 40 because you have to back it off. The IoT efficiency doesn't decrease as you back it off. What I mean by back off is, if you've got a 300 kilowatt klystron, you're running at 300 kilowatts. If something goes wrong with your cavity and the cavity wants 400 kilowatts, you've nowhere to go. 
So what you do is you run at 200 kilowatts, and then when your cavity wants more power, you've got headroom to go up. So we back it off so that the low level air system has somewhere to go if it needs more power. Um, and power and phase are kind of together. So if you've got a phase shift, you can correct it very quickly by having more power at a different phase. So your low level air system will always want more power than it's designed for. So you always have to back off your klystron so you've got some headroom. Um, so um, a 300 kilowatt klystron running at 200 kilowatts doesn't give you the same efficiency, it gets worse. Whereas an IoT and Tetrode, it doesn't. So while well, klystrons run at 6% efficiency, when you run them at lower power, they don't work quite as well because they have less RF input and they get less bunching, uh, but you still need the same DC input power. Whereas with the IoT, if you put less RF power in, it doesn't produce as much current because there's less going to the grid. Um, so klystrons tend to be a lot less efficient when running, although more, ef more efficient than tetrodes when, when they're full power. Um, but they have huge gains. This one's got 40 dB again. It's not unusual to see a 50 dB gain klystron. So um, 30 watts RF drive, so really simple. Very low power drives, much easier. And about the same lifetime as an IoT. Um, we can also combine tubes to get higher powers, as I mentioned when we talked about IoT. So this is the system for, for Diamond. They have 480 kilowatt IoTs. They combine them in sets of two to get 300 kilowatts coming out. It's a slightly complex circuit. You've got to have a bunch of combiner systems. You never just do a straight combination. You've always got to have some protection in here, so there's a load here in case there's some failure in one of the IoTs. So you have two combiners there, one combiner there, some phase shifters to correct the phase after you've combined with some protection loads and a circulator and another load to get the 300 kilowatts out. If you ever get a chance to go to Diamond, this is an entire room about this size filled with the IoTs um, for three sets, so it's, it's a big system. But it's cheaper, it's more efficient, uh, and can be more reliable in theory. So a comparison of the Klystron and IoT next to each other the Klystron has DC modulation, which gives a high gain, long device, but is expensive. Um, it's quite sensitive to the DC input. Um, if you have a jitter on your power supply, you get a jitter on your face coming out. Um, and as you reduce the input power, you get a reduction in efficiency, which isn't so good. The IoT is small and cheap. It has less output power. Um, and less efficiency than the Klystron, and lower gain than the Klystron, but can be combined together to get you higher power, um, but smaller and cheaper, and the efficiency is higher, um, it's, high, it's lower power, lower gain, but higher efficiency, the IoT. Now, there's a new option coming in, the new kit in the block, is the solid state power amplifier. So, you can buy yourself a wee amplifier that does um, 315 watts. Pretty easy. I've got I've done undergraduate student projects where they build 300 watt amplifiers. So you can buy them pretty easily in. Now, if you can combine four IOTs to give you four times the power, could you combine 10,000 300 watt amplifiers to give you uh, three megawatts? Well, yeah, probably can. Um, and that's what they're doing at Soleil. Well, that's what was developed at Soleil. Other people are doing it as well now. Um, where you have these wee 600 watt boards, or which is made up of two 300 watt boards, um, which they then plug in together. They have 726 times 315 modules and four towers with an output power of 180 kilowatts. Each module consisting of two silicon laterally diffused uh, metal oxide um, transistors. Um, it gives you 53 dB again and an efficiency of 50%. It's not bad compared to the Klystron, really. Um, the bit that's a problem is the cost. Um, a Klystron at, at this sort of spec would probably be about under a million anyway, maybe about half a million. Um, so that system's two million. So it's much more expensive. But, so why would you go for it? It's got less gain than the Klystron, less efficiency, um, it's more expensive. Why do you want to go for solid state technology? Well, one simple answer. Your klystron, running fine, running fine, running fine, fine, running fine, fail. Then you've got to take this big beast out of your accelerator and replace it. It takes about two weeks to replace the klystron. Slack got it down faster, but still, 
it's an appreciable amount of time to replace the Clystron. In that time, your light source isn't running, and all those people that have booked your beam lines don't get access to the beam, and you can't just shift it along later because they've all travelled from, from different countries to use your beam line. And actually, I was told the cost of a synchrotron shutting down is £15,000 per hour. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's the number I've been told for the cost of it not running. So you don't want your Clystron suddenly failing and then having two weeks shutdown. Now with this, it's got thousands of wee solid state modules, and they, because you've got so many statistics come in, so you've got such a statistical chance of one failing per day, and because you've got thousands of them, you can get pretty good statistics on that. So they go pop, 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 stay three per day. At night, when the machine's shut off for an hour, a technician comes in, gets the cars that are broken, unscrews them, takes them out, screws them back in again, you have, an, you have no downtime at all. Because you have to dump your beam to refill at some point anyway in all synchrotrons. So no one notices the downtime. It's, at, it's in the service gaps that you've already got in your system. So a solid state power amplifier should never fail. In fact, Soleil has never seen a failure, a, a machine stop due to their amplifiers ever. They have never seen any downtime due to these machines. And that's why you would want to use them. For a scientific machine, for Alice, this would be a waste of money. But for a light source, where downtime's critical, yeah, you, solid state's the only way to go. So most solid state, except most uh, synchrotrons are now moving to the solid state amplifiers, simply because the downtime's zero. So it's a, a nice system, but a bit, a bit, a lot of, a lot of chips, quite complicated. So uh, tubes versus power amplifiers. Uh, the SSPs have no warm up time. They start like that. Clystrons need to warm up. They're very reliable. They operate 100 volts. There's, that's something I didn't mention. These things operate 100 volts. A Clystron will operate at somewhere between 100 kilovolts and 50 kilovolts. This operates at 100 volts. Higher current, albeit, but 100 volts. So much easier to operate 100 volts. You don't have to worry about insulating in oil. You don't have to worry about breakdowns. It's a nice, simple system. Could be air cooled, no water. Very stable, and they blow up regularly, so you know when they're going to fail, and you can you can plan into it. The disadvantages is they're hideously complex. You do lose some losses in the combiners. Uh, when the transistor fails, you've got to stop it from affecting the other transistors, so you've got to isolate it. <clears throat> it's a bit fragile. It has very high losses, hence the 50% efficiency, which gives you low efficiency, and it's high maintenance. With a Clystron, you run it, and a technician has to go in once every two years to replace it. Uh, maybe less than that, maybe once every 10 years, depending on how often you're running. Um, with a solid state amplifier, you need a technician going in every night to replace modules. So a lot of maintenance required there, but no downtime. The other RF sources are the magnetrons. These aren't used in high power accelerators. They tend to be used in the low industrial ones. Magnetrons are what runs your microwave oven. You can get a magnetron for one kilowatt magnetron for 20 pence. Um, so they're very cheap, they're very robust, which is why they're used in industrial settings. Um, you basically have a coaxial tube, you have a cathode in the middle, anode on the outside, you have an electron cloud circling around it, which interacts with a, with a travelling RF field in the gaps. Um, and then it works similar way to Clystron, apart from it repeats as a periodic system. Um, it's an oscillator, not an amplifier, but so you can't control it. Well, you can control it, but it's difficult. In fact, Lancaster is one of the world's top places in researching and how to control these things, but most people don't. So typically they run uncontrolled. The frequency jitters about in time, your phase goes all over the place. So it doesn't work on a nice high precision machine like Alice, but it does work on an industrial processing one for printing cereal boxes or something, I don't know. Um, so um, they're nice and cheap, very cheap. Um, in terms of the cost, it's about a fifth of the cost of a Clystron for equivalent power. Um, and they can reach 5 megawatts quite easily, or 30 kilowatts CW, um, or 100 kilowatts at lower frequencies. Um, so they're, they're nice systems for, if you don't need the stability, they're the best choice. So here's a medical Linac one here from E2V. Um, it's a 3 gigahertz one, 5.5 megawatts, uh, 50 kV, so it's less than the Clystron. 2.3 uh, uh, pulse duration, 45% uh, efficiency. It's a nice rugged system, they don't break very often, um, and they're, they're really cheap. 
So the last slide I want to talk about is pulse compression. So say you want more power than you can get off your Klystron, which is 50 megawatts. What if you need 200 megawatts? Some systems do. Where do you go from there? Well, you can go like click and, and use a, a three beam system or a two beam system as they call it. Or you can do something called pulse compression. So energy is conserved, power isn't. So if you could find some way of filling a cavity for a long time with a low power pulse, store all the energy, and then suddenly switch that energy out so you got all that stored energy being deposited in a short period of time, you could get very high peak powers for a short period of time. And um, mainly um, Slack for a long time have been looking at how can you do this. And back in the 60s, we have a system called SLED. It's called the Stanford Linear Accelerator Energy Doubler Project <clears> or SLED. It doubles the, doesn't double the energy, it doubles the energy of the machine, not the energy in the pulse. So you have your Klystron, which operates long pulse, and it fills two cavities. Now these two cavities, will com the field from those two cavities when filled in steady state, will combine with the field from the Klystron such that no power gets to the accelerator. So all the power is stored in there. Basically, they destructively interfere at the, at the coupler to the accelerator, so that no power goes in towards the accelerator. So the power gets stored in these cavities, but doesn't go to the accelerator. And then suddenly, you add a 180 degree phase shift to your Klystron pulse very quickly. Then the field of the two cavities combines with the Klystron now to give you field at the accelerator as opposed to cancellation in the accelerator. And all the power gets dumped out of these cavities and the Klystron together in a, in a short period of time into the accelerator. So typically what you get is you get um, the, the length of the pulse decreases by a factor of 10. If you fill for 10 microseconds, you get a 1 microsecond pulse out. Um, typically you do it for 2 microseconds and 200 nanoseconds out. Um, but your power increases by a factor of 4 because it's not a lossless system. You don't get conservation of energy in it. Your power goes up by a factor of 4 for 10 times shorter pulse length. So you put, say, a 50 megawatt pulse in for um, 2 microseconds, you get a 200 megawatt pulse for 200 nanoseconds. And this is how um, a lot of the X-band technology works. Not the click stuff, but some of the other stuff that's been looked at for light sources at Trieste and things, and some of the stuff being done at Slack. As you use the pulse compressor to get your much higher power from a much smaller klystron. In fact, um, there are people now looking at using 10 megawatt klystrons to get 40 megawatts out because a four 10 megawatt klystrons is cheaper than one 50 megawatt klystron because of economies the way it works. Um, so pulse compressors can give you more power for a shorter pulse length, but you need to actually produce that power for the pulse length. So the, a 50 megawatt klystron isn't going to run more than two microseconds. So it means after the pulse compressor, the best you can do is 200 nanoseconds out. So when do you use what types? Well, this is power versus frequency. And you can see they each dominate in different areas. You can see that below the frequency of a klystron, below about one megahertz, you can see that mostly, uh, that's a klystron as well, actually, that's CW klystrons. Mostly you're dominated by tetrodes at low frequencies. Tetrodes and diacodes and triodes dominate up to about 200 megahertz. There's nothing that works below 200 megahertz other than those, apart from solid state power amplifiers. So you're completely dominated in that region by the tetrodes. Um, your solid state power amplifiers, uh, the, the chips run down here, but the actual tubes run up here. Now there's only a couple of them in volts, so there's not a lot of points on this graph. There's just the two points at the moment, but they're getting better all the time. Um, um, you've got IOTs up here. Now the Klystron gives you more power, but less efficiency and it's a bigger, more expensive system. So you would use the SSP or the IOT for different reasons in the Klystron, not just based on power. This is your CW klystrons, and this is some of your pulse klystrons up here. So you can see at different frequencies you would choose different tubes based on power, based on efficiency, based on reliability. Um, so in the range of 400 megahertz to 1.3 gigahertz, you have a choice. There's no simple answer. You could use klystrons, you could use uh, IOTs, you could use solid state power amplifiers. So depending on what you want in terms of efficiency and reliability, you choose that. IOTs are normally higher efficiency, but limited to 100 kilowatts. I need combining. SSPs are very low downtime, but expensive and efficient and needs parts replaced. Klystrons are high power, difficult to swap, and if one breaks you have trouble, and they can add a lot more phase noise. 
Uh, tetrodes are very low gain, so you need more amplifiers to drive them. Not very good for high frequencies. And magnetrons are unsuitable where, for big accelerators we need stability. We need to combine lots of tubes together. But if you've got a 5 megavolt or a 20 megavolt electron machine, um, then magnetrons are your best choice. And that's why Electra's radiotherapy machines all run on magnetrons. But uh, Varians use klystrons, so again, it's a choice. The other complication in there is the frequency. These tubes are expensive to build and they don't scale. A 400 megahertz klystron doesn't work at 500 megahertz. You can't just fiddle about the numbers. So you can only buy tubes where the tubes exist, which means you can't pick any frequency for your accelerator. Your accelerator frequency has to be a number of discrete points. And this is down here. You can't have an accelerator that works at any other frequency than these frequencies, because these are the only frequencies in which you can buy tubes. So you have 200 megahertz, two, well, there's lower ones as well, but I've missed them. 200, 267, 352, 400, 508, 650, 704, and then the gigahertz ones, 1.3, 2.87, 3, 3.7, 3.9, 5.6, 9.3, 11.424, 11 11.994. No other frequencies exist. These are the only frequencies you can buy tubes at. So when you're designing your accelerators, as accelerator physics or whatever you do, you have to pick one of these numbers, because otherwise you can't buy an RF source to drive it. So it's a bit of a problem. And these frequencies correspond, if you try and do the math, you will find out that each of these frequencies corresponds to an integer number of either inches or millimeters, which is why we have European and American eh, frequency ranges. So, for example, in Europe, we use 3 gigahertz, 12 gigahertz, so on. In America, they use 2.87 or 11.424, because that's an integer number of inches, and that's an integer number of millimeters. And we use the metric system, and they use inches. So no other more complicated reason than that, but it causes so much issue for us that you, know, you can't transfer S-Span components between Slack and CERN, for example because they use slightly different frequencies. And then inertia builds in. We always use European frequencies um, because it has to fit with all the other accelerators we've built previously. And you end up that yeah, you end up in a big mess of two separate frequency ranges in America and, and Europe. All right, any questions? Yep. What's the ma maximum uh, output power record for the solid state power amplifier? Oh, I don't know. It's probably not much above 200 kilowatts, I would think. Uh, what's BXC? Uh, so is 500, I think. 500 megahertz, I think. It might be less than that. It might be 200. I can't remember off the top of my head. I've probably got it noted here somewhere. If I go back to my slides. Probably right there. So Lay's the best, basically. So Lay's systems. Um, Talis had done something. Yeah, I've written it down. Uh, but I don't know if I put it in there. No, I haven't. But it's the Soleil system. I could find out quite quickly. Um, Isn't that 180 kilowatts output power? Oh, yeah. It's 180 kilowatts is the Soleil system. I can't remember its frequency. It's either 200 or 500. I can't remember which. Um, but is there, you is can look it up. Source? Is there any black source or, LED, uh, or syn synchronous uh, facility to use this solid state? Yes. Soleil uses solid state. Uh, it's a synchronous light source. And uh, Brazilian Light Source uses solid state. ESRF are doing an upgrade right now to replace all their IOTs or Clystron, I can't remember what they had, with, I, with solid state power amplifiers. Diamond aren't at the moment replacing them, but I've heard murmurs that they're thinking about at some point maybe thinking about replacing with solid state, but it's not confirmed yet. Um, also, Elba Linac uses solid state power amplifiers as well. Just be 10 kilowatt ones. So it's, it's a similar facility to Alice, so it doesn't need a lot of power. So they've got 10 kilowatt solid state power amplifiers. Siemens um, introduced a, a, a document a while ago, which they took the Siemens name off of it, but everyone knew it was Siemens, um, which said they, they could produce 3 megawatts at S band, but uh, it turns out they couldn't produce it. They just wanted to judge what the market would be if such a device was available. Um, so there's, there's thoughts about it. There's a, most transistors now work on silicon, GAN, or gas uh, substrates. Now, there is some work by Siemens on using um, silicon carbide as uh, transistors. Now, if that works, you will get higher powers at higher frequencies out of um, silicon carbide. Um, 
because it's got a, a bigger band gap and stuff. So um, they think that higher powers will be available once these things come through. But Siemens have been really secretive about it, and we don't know what stage it's at. But the, the, the potential for the future for these new silicon carbide transistors to come out and to completely revolutionise accelerators. They also say, which I'm not, I'm not sure I believe it or not, that they work with reflections as well. Now that's interesting because if you can work with 100% reflections, you don't need circulators and you can plug them directly into the cavity. So you don't need to have all the protection and transmission. You could have a lot of wee transistors actually plugged directly into the cavity, which would allow you to significantly reduce the size of your accelerator. But the downside of these solid state power amplifiers is they do degrade with time. So as a while ago, and you won't find this in any papers because they don't want you to know about it, the um, the UK air traffic control replaced all their radars from TWT to solid state power amplifiers a while ago. But the problem is you have to replace them every day. And they've got radars all over the country. We had to have technician channel. So it was so much a headache, they replaced them all back to TWTs in the end. But they don't tell you about that because you're not supposed to know. But um, it's interesting. You need a radar house, someone leaving there. Yeah, it's a bit of a problem. So solid state power amplifiers are still on the fringes a wee bit. For light sources, they're perfect. But no one's using them for anything other than light sources at the moment. But that might come. They might replace Klystrons one day. I don't know. I don't see it happening anytime soon. But who knows? Could happen. All right. OK, so the homework's back there. There's a tutorial on magnets at 2 p.m. in here. And then it's the Christmas thing at 3 o'clock. Thank you. And I'll do my studio next week at 2 p.m. Oh. I've, I've got a question on the frequencies. Yep. Just because I don't know much about this. Yeah. Uh, you said there was no point in trying to work out how the frequency is. Yep. Wouldn't that make it kind of. I don't know, what would be the advantage of changing the frequency if there wouldn't be any advantage? Wouldn't it be justified by just making a few. Yeah, for that specific frequency. You would have to convince CPI or IoT to make to a different frequency. See, they've got a catalog line, and uh, they don't have a lot of engineers designing Klystrons. They have the Klystron back catalog, and they churn them out. If you want a new Klystron, they'd have to get designers. Well, not hire someone, but move them from other parts of the business to then design you a Klystron. They can do it. They can do it. It has been done before. Um, ESS is getting CPI to build them a brand new IoT, for example. It can be done, but it's going to cost you. Right. So if you've got a thousand IoTs you need, like like uh, ESS does, then the cost of getting them to design a new IoT isn't too much. Yeah, that's what I was, what I was wondering. If yeah. it would me, does it make sense working at different frequencies? And if it does, wouldn't that justify the custom-made thing? Usually, there's a frequency close enough by that you could work. Right. You know, okay, so you, at that point you think, yeah, just buy the one that's yeah, already yeah. been made. What's the difference between, like, for example, for Click? Just to, like, don't know anything about, remember, I'm a material scientist, yeah, I'm yeah. not a physicist. So. For, for Click, the optimum frequency was actually 15. 15. But they chose 12 because there's a Klystrat so 12 not. and it's close yeah, enough. Okay. So, yeah, but then again, ESS are getting a new IoT built because... Because it's a different type of thing, it's a new machine that's been designed, and at that point they thought... Hmm. Well, it's not because of that. They think that IoTs don't come, like... There's no, they've got a new way of doing IoT that can reach higher powers, and they they want they want, they want CPI out. to try it. Yeah. CPI's done some studies on it, and they want CPI to do it as a production chip now. But with DSS, with DSS money, you know, the development costs get lost. If you were doing it for Alice, no, you no can forget chance. about it. Well, actually, in Alice, we did design new IoTs, but that's that, that for political story, reasons. Okay. <laughs> Um, second question. You mentioned before that when you were working with the flight strike, it takes it probably lasts a year or two yeah. before you change well, it. Uh, 35,000 hours lifetime. Right. So it depends on how you're running it. But if you're running it 24 right. hours a day, 7 days a week, it course, ends up yeah. being about 2 hours. What about superconductive cavities? How long does it take? Well, how long do they last before they get changed? Well, we oh, I don't know. Days. No one's yeah. ever really ran it enough to change them. They do degrade over time. But no one's got to the point where they had to replace them for that reason. Seabass right. replaced theirs for, to, to, for an upgrade, but no one's right, but ever... Not, not a DK problem. Yeah, not a DK problem, it's just an upgrade. No ah. one's really had to replace them due to DK yet. So theoretically speaking, now we have these for the last 25 years. 
Probably. Configuration of the accelerator. Yeah, probably. No, I mean, no one knows for sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't, there's no machine that ran that long that's been superconducting really that hasn't ah. had stuff replaced. Okay. Um, well, do they, not, do they run less than that? I mean, or is it just not many that have been built that have been running for that many? Yeah, months? that's it. I mean, let's run for a long time. Um, Yeah. Oh, by the way, you know, in CST, hang on, you yeah. know, 